Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to Extraordinary Wildlife in Your Backyard, Season 1, Episode 11, The Hunger Flames Catching Fireflies. Uh, I decided a change in the slide design was appropriate for an insect that can luminesce, so we're going to go with a dark background today. Uh, before we get started, I know that a few of you are new to birding and have gotten and and have gotten hooked recently, like Marilyn, and, and others of you have been birding for a long time. Uh, and I'd like to share a, a teaser for just a really fantastic web series called The Birds of North America, hosted by Jason Ward. Uh, so we're just going to watch this teaser quickly. You may need to adjust your volume as I switch to video, um, but we'll give it a, a shot here. Do you think birds go around counting us? They're peopling. That's a rose-breasted grosbeak squeaking. And now it's singing. Oh, she's sitting on chicks. Bobbing his tail. Oh, that's great. That's a quick transition. What's that over there? Oh, yeah, that's a beauty. Yep, 100% bard. It's a female black ball. American robin. Cardinal? Hold up, hold up. Who's coming through? There's a bird coming over. Oh, look, look. Wow. Look, 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 look. Yeah. And look at this one right here. Right in front of us, yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, there's some action out there. Yeah. That's a cormorant. Yeah, it's a buffalo head. Male harlequin duck, the sexiest duck on earth. I don't care what anybody says. Oh. Right here. Oh, come on, stay still. Flap, 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 flap. Right there, right there, right there, right there, right, right there. there. Yep. Or it's a warbler. Those are two teenagers doing a drug deal. <laughs> you have some ink on your yes. arms. This is a loggerhead shrike. This is a deer falcon. A falcon. Come on. Oh, yeah, oh, that's really beautiful. I'm talking. Don't look at that bird. We're trying to connect, and here you're gonna leave me. It was a falcon. I I don't care. sometimes to contain your excitement, especially when you're this close to a bird. No bird is going to be left unseen. All right. So again, that's uh, The Birds of North America. It's an online series uh, hosted by Jason Ward. I encourage you to check it out. Um, and I'm also a bit of a podcast junkie, and it was really surprising to see a friend of mine, uh, Viviana Ruiz Gutierrez, an ecologist at Cornell University, interviewed for uh, the NPR podcast um, called Shortwave yesterday in an episode titled Backyard Birding 101. It's a, it's a fun, short episode, and, and what really resonates with me is one of the reasons I started these weekly episodes is just about how observing the common things uh, and asking the little questions uh, gets you into these wonderful places of thought, of learning, and experiences. So if you have a, a chance, I encourage you to check out that 15-minute podcast. And every week, I like to, to browse through the Urban Ecology Center in my backyard website for new content. Um, I encourage you to as well. Uh, this week, I, I came across an old short, fun video produced by educator Kelly Johnson that follows frogs through the season. And again, there's content on there for, for people of all ages. All right, so to follow up from our, our scientific poll this morning, uh, in which some of you voted more than once, um, since I'm not going to say both firefly and lightning bug throughout the lecture, I looked at this map to help determine the standard I'll use today. So this shows you the geographic linguistic breakdown of where people predominantly call them fireflies, essentially the northern and western regions of the US, Alaska and Hawaii, um, and where they predominantly call them lightning bugs in the south, uh, including Texas. Interestingly, well, some of Texas. Interestingly, there are almost no fireflies that light up as adults west of the Rockies. There's hardly any, but they still use the term firefly. And um, I, I, I don't know, I love how this map also points out that the, the blue areas are impinging on the yellow areas as, as fireflies becoming increasingly popular with younger Americans. So this this kind of starts to sound like a political poll and, and then the disagreements in New York City too. Uh, but since I'm giving the talk and I called them fireflies growing up and objectively I'm giving this lecture from Milwaukee where a 
according to the map, fireflies are in charge. I will mostly use the term firefly for the talk today, but feel free to use whichever term you want uh, if you decide to give a talk on the topic. So, all right, quickly let's determine where they are in the phylogenetic tree. We find the firefly starting with, uh, with kingdom. The firefly is an animal. Uh, it's an arthropod and it is an insect. So up until now, all of the same groups as we did last week for the spittle bug. And then again, looking at this insects uncensored chart we had last week, we put the spittle bug in the hemipteran order. And remember, hip, hemipteran means half wing, so hemipteran, because only half of the forewing is hardened and the other half is membranous, forms that distinctive X on the back of the hemipterans. And since hemipterans are true bugs, and we're talking lightning bugs this week, uh, you may expect the lightning bug to be grouped with the rest of the true bugs, but it's not. Um, or maybe because they're fireflies, you might expect the firefly to be grouped with the rest of the flies and the diptera, but it's not. The firefly is actually a type of beetle, so it lands in the order Coleoptera, which again translates to sheathed wing, referring to that hardened shield-like uh, forewing that protects the flying hind wings that are underneath. But in order to fly, they have to move those sheathed wings out of the way, which gives us another chance to look at this awesome photo. Uh, insects are the largest group of arthropods, and beetles are the largest group of insects. So by placing the firefly in with the beetles, we're putting it into a tight-knit group of about 400,000 known and named specimens that form the beetles. Um, as I mentioned, the, the four wings have have hardened into what are called elytra, which protect the flying wings that are underneath. Uh, and instead of uh, overlapping to form that X, uh, you saw in the, in the hemiptera, the tooth sheaths come together in a straight line down the back. So that's a good identifying characteristic of the beetles or the coleopterans. Most beetles can fly, uh, but usually not that well. If you've ever had a beetle in your house and it starts flying around, they, they're, they're not the most graceful of landers. Um, They'll often bump into a wall or a window a few times uh, before finally getting, getting the wheels down and getting on the runway. Beetles make up about 40% of all described insects and 25% of all described animals. So one out of every four animals on the planet is a beetle. They're found just about everywhere in every habitat except the oceans and except the polar regions. They eat both plants and animals and are extremely important decomposers uh, in, in your natural communities. They are both agricultural pests, and they're also consumers of agricultural pests. The largest group of beetles is the weevils, or the snout beetles, with about 83,000 species, one of which you may know went on to fame and fortune in Hollywood. Uh, there are some other crazy cool beetles like whirligig beetles that trap air under that elytra and they use it like little scuba gear, uh, which allows them to dive. Um, or there's the voracious predaceous diving beetle on the right. There's the ancient looking water penny seen here in its larval form, also a beetle. There's the rhinoceros beetle, which is the central character of my favorite personal beetle story up on uh, a place called Chambers Island in, Gre in Green Bay. Um, the sun had set and we were walking on the beach and all of a sudden we just heard this, this low vibration, this whir, like a th -th 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 -th. Past, it, it went past my head like a helicopter. And then, and then he, and I heard another one and then another one. And then I look up and as the light is fading, you're just, we're just seeing dozens of these huge rhinoceros beetles flying right at us and past us. Um, it was probably a synchronous mating flight, but, but they looked like paratroopers storming a beach and they were, they were massive and there were so many of them. So uh, by far one of the top 10 coolest natural events I've ever witnessed. Uh, we have the infamous emerald ash borer beetle, the ladybird beetle, which some of you may refer to as a ladybug. And this tarpella beetle, we found one of these scattering in Washington Park by the swimming pool once during a bat walk. Um, and I've been through that park hundreds of times without seeing them, but of course at night it's entirely different. 
Uh, so beetles are everywhere if you look for them. Two of my favorite beetle catchers are John and Heidi, two volunteers who just get super excited finding beetles and then force everyone around them to also get super excited about beetles. And incidentally, beetles were a major fascination of a man by the name of Charles Darwin. And one of my favorite Darwin quotes comes in a letter he wrote to a cousin who is equally obsessed with beetles, where he said, uh, he said, I am dying by inches from not having anybody to talk to about insects. Beetles undergo a complete metamorphosis and some exhibit extreme sexual dimorphism between males and females, such as these stag beetles, where the male on the right uses his massive mandibles to fight other males. Beetles have a long history with humans, including the sacred scarab beetles in ancient Egypt, which are, are dung beetles. Uh, and over 300 species of beetles are food sources for humans. And there's so much more we could say about beetles, but I'm gonna move on to the featured beetle group for today, the Lampyridae, or the lightning bugs or the fireflies. A fitting name, Lampyridae, for an insect that lights up. Uh, they produce light through bioluminescence, and luminescence is different from incandescence. So, uh, in the extremely inefficient incandescent light bulb, uh, electricity passes through a tungsten filament, and as electrons from the current bump into electrons in the metal, they vibrate, and the extra energy is released as a photon. Now, remember, only a very small frequency of wavelengths are visible to the human eye, and most metal that is heated through electricity releases energy in the infrared region uh, as heat waves that you can feel but you can't see. However, if metal is heated to about 4,000 degrees, which is the case in the tungsten in your light bulb, uh, it also re releases plenty of visible light. The, the amount of energy lost through heat in the non-visible spectrum in the traditional light bulb is staggering, which is why they are so inefficient. And if you've ever touched an incandescent light bulb after it's been on for a while, you've surely felt that inefficiency. So, since it would be fatal for a firefly to reach 4,000 degrees, uh, they employ an alternate strategy. They produce, produce light through luminescence instead of incandescence. So in luminescence, this, is, this, this involves a chemical reaction to produce light, which is much more efficient and because it doesn't require heat and because it generates almost no heat, it's sometimes called cold light. In the case of fireflies, all of the energy that's released is in the form of visible light. There is no infrared, there's no ultraviolet radiation. In fact, there isn't even any blue light or dark red light, only the central greens, yellows, and pale reds. So in many respects, this is one of the most efficient light producing machines we know of, uh, at least in terms of human perception. And all of the energy, almost all of the energy is released as uh, visible light and a, a very, very small amount is released as heat. Um, all, species, all species in the Lampyridae family glow during the larval stage. Every single member of this uh, group glow during the larval stage. Um, but as you are probably aware, there are a lot of non-firefly insects and other life forms that also produce bioluminescence. One of the coolest, in my opinion, is mushrooms. We don't, we don't have a lot of really cool glowing mushrooms in our parts, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, and they're often pretty conspicuous. But if you go out just about anywhere on a summer night in a forest, particularly where there's little or no light pollution, you can probably find some. Uh, most of our glowing fungi feed on, on rotting wood. So fallen logs are an excellent place to look for them. And the effect of the glowing mushroom uh, is called fox fire sometimes fairy fire, or in some places, chimpanzee fire. Um, and the jack-o'-lantern mushroom on the right is especially cool because only the gills glow, producing that kind of eerie Halloween-y effect. So nice job to whoever named the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. There are also centipedes and millipedes that produce bioluminescence uh, in forests. And even though this talk is about fireflies, I couldn't not show you this video from New Zealand because it's just too cool. So what you're going to see are worms that produce a glowing silk 
and they use that silk like a spider's web to capture prey, which as the video indicates, uh, produces scenes straight out of the movie Avatar. So we'll take a quick look. I will uh, send you guys that video. You can watch it in a, in a bigger screen, but it's pretty amazing. Um, most of the really crazy glowing organisms uh, occur in a, in a particular area of the deep ocean. Um, and it's where you just get these really crazy, uh, there is no natural light that reaches that deep. Um, and so, uh, a lot of these organisms produce their own light, and there's a lot of reasons that they do it. Uh, sometimes they do it to lure in prey. Um, sometimes they do it to actually just produce light so they can see. Some of them don't even have eyes, uh, and um, so it gives some the competitive advantage. And uh, it's, yeah, that's, that's another just crazy, crazy world. And I just learned that there's something called a vomiting shrimp and when frightened, it will essentially vomit bioluminescence in the same way a squid ejects ink. And then the masters of bioluminescence are the dinoflagellates, uh, small protists in the plankton. And when disturbed, dinoflagellates will bioluminesce. We don't know exactly why they do it, uh, but one theory is called the burglar alarm theory. Essentially, if little fish start eating the dinoflagellates, they start glowing to attract larger fish to eat the little fish that they're eating that are eating them. Uh, so, whatever the the reason is, it just it, it produces this uh, these amazing patterns um, anytime the water is disturbed. And just about everywhere in the world, you get areas like this. Uh, there are bioluminescent bays that you can where people can kayak or swim. In, in the glowing water, um, boats and waves will, will also produce this phenomenon. This, this phenomenon is called Milky Sea, and sometimes it can be seen from space. Uh, and in the movie Apollo 13, James Lovell tells the story of a, a pilot who, for some reason, loses his navigation system, but is able to follow the Milky Sea produced by the wake of the aircraft carrier to find the boat and land. Uh, there's an excellent podcast about bioluminescence uh, from uh, the Stuff You Should Know podcast. It's, it's really fantastic, and I'll, I'll end today with a video from them. So all fireflies glow, but not everything that glows is a firefly. And some species of firefly lose the ability to glow in the adult form. So you may have heard the term glow worm before, and this usually refers to the larval form of fireflies. 
So glowworms become fireflies, just like caterpillars become butterflies and spittle bugs become frog hoppers. Uh, there are some species that are called glowworms as adults that aren't in this order at all, or there, there are some species of, of true flies uh, that aren't in this family, excuse me. Um, and there are also, so, so there's glowworms that aren't fireflies. Um, but we usually refer to the larval form of fireflies as glowworms. And here's a female glowworm from Europe with the lights on and off, tail up like a scorpion, and this female never morphs into the flying version. Most fireflies are nocturnal, and uh, as you might have guessed, but there are some diurnal species of fireflies, and most of those don't glow as an adult, or if they do glow, you'll only find them glowing in dark shady spaces. So it wouldn't make any sense to glow in the, in the bright light. And as you mentioned earlier, we are in the heart of mating season right now. Female fireflies will soon be laying eggs just below the surface of the ground. And in a few weeks, those eggs will hatch into the larvae. And for some, they'll, they'll be in the larval, a lot of them, they'll be in that larval form for most of their life, uh, for several years even. Uh, in the larval form, they're, they're voracious predators. Uh, they'll, they feed on snails and slugs, uh, other insect larvae, worms. Um, and uh, like some spiders, they will inject a kind of digesting venom into the body of their prey. As adults, some remain predatory, but others switch to feeding on plant pollen or nectar. And some, like that European glowworm we saw, uh, they don't even have a mouth in the adult form. So they switch to the no food diet and die very soon after reproduction. So like a lot of other beetles and, and other insects, mayflies, they spend most of their life in the larval form and the adult form is, is primarily for reproduction and, and passing on the genes. Tim, yep. I have a yep. question. Do we have worms that glow around here? Well, uh, all, of the, all of our fireflies uh, glow in the worm form, in the larval form. So we do have glowworms here. All of our fireflies are glowworms early in their life. Um, I don't know of a lot of uh, adult glowworms in this area, but partly I just haven't, this is kind of new to me. Um, a lot of the examples I came across were in Europe, uh, in Asia, but um, so the answer is yes, we do have glow worms here because all fireflies enter that glow worm stage. But to the other part of the question, I don't know how many adult glow worms we have here. Maybe some of you do. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, does glowing require energy? It requires energy and that's a good question. I mean, uh, it, there's a lot of this that, that they still don't know. They don't know how controllable it is, whether it's some of it's like a reflex or uh, whether they can turn it on or off. For a lot of species and fireflies in particular, they need to let in oxygen, just like a, just like a fire, a campfire needs oxygen. Um, so in some cases, it's a matter of opening a hole that'll allow oxygen in when the chemicals mix, um, because if they mix without oxygen, they won't glow. So it requires energy to produce the chemicals that glow. It requires the energy to turn on and off the systems. Um, and so I guess, you know, there's no free lunch kind of thing. Yes, there, 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 does, there, there is energy needed, but to what extent? I think we're still learning a lot of that, um, but that's an excellent question. All right, and then we have one more question. Do the fireflies west of the Rockies glow in their larval form, just yes. not in the adult form. Exactly. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. So all, every, every known species of firefly uh, in the Lampyridae glow as in the larval form, but just not all of them in the adult form. So yes, all of the fireflies west of the Rockies, most of which don't glow in the adult form, do glow in the larval form. And we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between glowing in the larval form and glowing in the adult form, but um, all these excellent questions, um, which kind of, which, which leads to really our last, our last couple of important uh, remaining questions, which is how do they glow and why do they glow? Um, so 
again, we, we don't know exactly how all species bioluminesce. Essentially, fireflies use the same concept found in the glow sticks that you can purchase at your local Walgreens. To get a glow stick to light, you bend it, and what you're doing is you're essentially allowing two different chemicals to combine that produce the glow. And, and essentially, that's the same thing that's happening usually in the abdomen of a lightning bug. There are two groups of chemicals that are wonderfully called luciferin and luciferase that combine with each other. Um, those are groups of chemicals. They're not specific types of chemicals, just like there are things that are acids and there are things that are bases. Uh, there are chemicals that are luciferins and there's chemicals that are luciferases. Uh, essentially, uh, when they combine together and again, usually with oxygen to produce light. Luciferin is a group of chemicals that produces the light and the luciferases are the enzymes that catalyze it. Uh, which brings us again to another very important question. If, if Lucifer, which by the way means light bringer, so if, if Lucifer means light bringer, why do we give the name light bringer or light giver to the devil? Uh, the folks on, this, on the podcast didn't answer the question, couldn't answer the question. So maybe one of you who have a little more theological experience can explain why uh, the devil is called Lucifer. Um, but we can talk about that later. And then we move on to the question of why do they glow? In larvae, the answer is very likely that the glowing serves as a warning signal to predators, uh, much in the same way that you have poisonous butterflies that are bright or venomous snakes that are very bright. It's that aposematic warning, uh, warning potential predators to stay away. Uh, don't bother eating me. I'm going to make you sick or I might kill you. And in fact, fireflies are toxic to almost all vertebrate predators. Uh, there's a story of, of one research scientist who took a, an insect larvae, uh, a glow worm, and just put it to his lips. And then his lips started to numb and his airway started to, uh, to do something funny. So he stopped that experiment right there. So uh, stay away from, from eating them. Um, but again, so, so the glow worms, the larval forms that all of them do, it's likely to tell predators, don't eat me. I'm toxic, and that would be a lose-lose situation if you tried. For adult fireflies, uh, however, the, just like the color of a bird or the song of a frog, most of the light shows that we see at night are the result of firefly courtship to pass on genes. Each species has its own color and flash pattern like a fingerprint, just like each warbler has its own song pattern. And the light show is often combined with pheromones that we can't detect. Uh, so it's usually light or pheromones or both, and often there's a signal response. So obviously the, the fireflies that are west of the Rockies, they use pheromones to court, um, but, but ours use a combination. So there's, again, a signal and a response. Usually it's a male signaling and looking for a female to respond to the same pattern that he just produced. In species where female adults don't fly, they they'll often climb up onto vegetation and wait for a signaling male to come to fly over to it. Um, according to the American Museum of Natural History, as quoted in Mental Floss, males fly through the air and search for females with a species-specific light display. Some flash only once, some emit flash trains of up to nine carefully timed pulses, others fly in specific aerial patterns, briefly dipping before sharply ascending and forming a J of light. A few even shake their abdomens from side to side and appear to be twinkling. So these colors and patterns allow scientists, uh, both professional and community scientists, to survey areas for fireflies. Uh, the Urban Ecology Center has been collaborating with the Milwaukee Public Museum the past few years to do firefly counts, which involves observing through hula hoops for a set amount of time and recording the results. If you're interested in learning more about your back bar, uh, about your backyard fireflies, uh, more than just observing and enjoying their show. Uh, there is this excellent book called Fireflies, Glowworms, and Lightning Bugs, Identification and Natural History of the Fireflies of the Eastern and Central United States and Canada. And there are several charts available uh, in the book, just like you have your warbler identification charts. Uh, and elsewhere, you can find these. They, they help break down the light colors and patterns 
to allow for species ID, much like a bird field guide breaks down song and color patterns. There are a few places in the world, and just a few places in the world, where fireflies exhibit simultaneous bioluminescence, where all of the fireflies in a population synchronize their flash patterns, uh, including the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. So it's a bit of a, uh, uh, a lot of people will go to this, this place in the Smoky Mountains. Uh, it's kind of like a Mecca and just to observe these firefly, I guess the true, the true form of the flash mob. Um, and, and then in that population, after a period of synchronized flashing, the males die. And then you have the femme fatale fireflies in the genus Photuris. The females in this group can accu accurately reproduce the light pattern of a smaller genus of fireflies, but not to mate with them, they lure in the males to eat them. So they can break the code of smaller species of fireflies, lure them in, and then of course, um, eat them. And one thing that I hear quite a bit from adults my age and older, is something along the lines that we heard, you know, it's, it's, there really don't seem to be as many fireflies around as there used to be. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember seeing fireflies everywhere in huge numbers. And this, this isn't the case of walking to school uphill both ways. Firefly, firefly populations around the world have been declining for a variety of reasons. Uh, the first, re first reason is kind of the same reason you hear everywhere. Uh, Anytime you have declines in wildlife populations, it's habitat loss um, by humans. Secondly, the increased use of broad spectrum pesticides and weed killers have likely had a huge negative impact on fireflies. And another likely culprit has to do with light pollution. Uh, since fireflies depend on dark areas for reproduction, the increase of nighttime light around the globe has had a big impact. But Unlike many insects, people have a soft spot for fireflies, and so they can be a good species to rally around for conservation. And in so doing, you also conserve all the non-flashy species of insects that are also in danger. So we'll wrap up the talk today with a, a video by the folks at How Stuff Works uh, that kind of summarizes this uh, firefly situation. Hi there, and welcome to Don't Be Dumb. I'm Josh Clark. Thank you for joining me. Have you ever heard that lightning bugs are disappearing? It's true, and nobody's 100% sure why. See? Lightning bugs, also known as fireflies, depending on where you live and what kind of person you are, like to make their home in rotting leaves and hollowed out logs, which tend to be in the woods. The problem is, humans like to turn woods into subdivisions which means that it makes fewer places for lightning bugs to live, which could be one reason why they're starting to disappear. Another reason why lightning bugs might be disappearing is because there are more cars on the road than before. And with cars, lightning bugs go splat. And Lightning bug researchers say that all of the lights from human civilization are causing a problem too. Lightning bugs use their bioluminescent bodies to signal each other to come on over and mate. But when humans introduce light pollution from things like porch lights and stuff, the bioluminescence of the lightning bugs gets drowned out and the lightning bugs have fewer opportunities to mate. Hence a decrease in the population. So the next time somebody says to you, hey, where all the lightning bugs go? You set them straight and tell them Josh sent you.
Thank you for joining me. And with that riveting high energy description of fireflies, uh, we're going to end the talk today.